So let's start with Yamel then. Yamel, what is the biggest news you read today regarding trade in the newspapers in the past week? With what, sorry? What is the biggest news or any news that you read about trade in the past week? About trade. You were supposed to read the newspapers. Yeah. So. Well, I read that Brazil and uh, Mexico will increase their uh, their economy this year. Well, it's the the trade. If I the trade or their economy? Well, their economy because of trade. Yeah. Still, um, How do you figure that out? Why? Why is it going to happen? What kind of trade? Trade between Mexico and Brazil, or trade between who and who? With the world? Yes. Okay. What exactly are they going to be trading with the world? What is Mexico trading with the world? What do you think we buy from outside? What do you think we sell? Uh, I think we sell oil. Uh, that's an easy one. Yes. So, oil, that's true. Commodities. What are the commodities? Uh, corn, rice. Uh, You're absolutely sure of that? Or you guess? No, I know that, that we are exporting corn. Uh -huh. I know. You know? Yes. Okay. So what you're going to do for next class is going to bring to all of us, and you will present to us, what is the balance of payments of Mexico, and have all those components of the balance of payments. Okay? Agreed? Okay. We all agree with that. And if corn is not there, what do we do to her? Mm -hmm. I think that it was also that the economics were going to increase because of the investment. Because Mexico was making uh, like new reforms mm -hmm. that make uh, trade easier, so that that's really attractive for foreigners to invest here. Yeah, but you do agree with her that we are exporting corn? I don't know. You don't know. Okay, so she's going to show to all of us that we are not exporting corn next Friday. Right. We probably are, okay, I'm going to ask you a favor, okay? Give me your name when you, so I can learn the names, okay? Mariana. Mar Mariana. Uh, You're the second Mariana in the group, yeah? Sorry? Mariana? Yes. So we have one Mariana, two Marianas, okay? Yes. Okay. Because we import corn from the US, uh, well, I don't, I don't know that, that, that time, but I know that we import corn from the United States. Does that in any way will imply that we do not export corn? I guess so, but I don't know. Why would you guess? Because if we are importing corn, it's because we don't have a, the, uh, to cover the demand. You don't have enough production inside Mexico. OK. So what you will be saying will be, OK, if we really are importing corn, then it stands to logic that we should not be exporting corn. Yeah. However, it could happen. Yeah? Yeah or no? Yes. Why? Because of that, because if you are importing some product, it's because maybe you don't have... No, no, what I say is, you may be exporting corn anyway. Why will it happen? If, if you think it is possible, why will it be possible? And if you think it's not possible, then why uh, do you think it's not possible? Because if you can export to some other place that doesn't have corn at all, and maybe you don't have a good uh, production of corn that you can export to another country. That doesn't okay. have But let, let's suppose this way. So, so you are of the opinion that if we are importing corn, that implies we are not exporting corn at all. Mm, I guess so. <laughs> you can guess yes or no. Okay, you have to defend that, okay? okay. So we're going to come back to it. Someone else was raising your hand, yes. Well, I, I want to, well, it wasn't about the current discussion. I want to say something about a news I read, right? Okay. Yes. Well, it was that right now it's taking place in the World Economic Forum. And uh, I would enough. Uh, what is the World Economic Forum? What is it? She knows. What is the World Economic Forum? What's she referring to? many world views uh, unite to, to talk about the uh, economic problems and the year solutions yes. to make. Where does it take place? That was excellent. He knows very well. So what is 
Where is the, the World Economic Forum? She's going to explain it a little bit. Where? Well, I was reading yesterday and I think it's an annual meeting where global leaders uh, gather around to discuss worldwide problems and try to make solutions. I think that's the World Economic Forum. Okay. What do you think they will be discussing this year? The most important international issue this year? Well, I, I read about um, the Europe, the, all the problems that is happening right now in Europe. Also, they, that um, the perspective of global economy is uh, to will not increase. Um, that also, and the the the. But the two things that you already said, one of them is the euro. The euro. Okay, and the other one is the possibility that growth in the world is not really happening here. What, what, what they can do. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the first one. What implies the euro? Why will we be discussing the euro in an international meeting where world leaders are gathering along with business people, the most important business people in the world. Why? Why will we be discussing right now the Euro? The problem that Europe is having because they were a political union with uh, no barriers between countries with, uh, for their citizens, but they didn't realize that their economies were too different to have the same currency. So now they are suffering because some countries can't afford to have a currency and some have a big GDP like uh, Germany. Okay. One of the largest trade agreements in the world is the European Union, yeah? Within, within the European Union there are two types of countries. One group of countries which has decided, this is a number of countries, 17, which have decided that the euro will be a common currency. Yeah? And the rest of the countries, they have decided to have their own currency. Once you do this, what happens? So you started with a trade agreement. You are moving into a political agreement. You are trying to reach that point. You have not yet reached that point. So you move into a second stage, and the second stage is a common currency. So you are creating, in fact, an area of euros as the currency. This is called, therefore, the euro area, OK? And these are the countries, 17 of them, which hold one common monetary policy. We are talking in this class agreements, treaties, where people will be joining in some specific areas of economics. The simplest one is trade. We move into trade by doing some agreement on what can or what cannot get into my country or your country with or without obstacles to trade. So we are eliminating tariffs, we are eliminating quotas, we are eliminating many other of those aspects that will be difficult in the trade between two or several nations. As we do that, we move into a first stage, which is a trade agreement. Then we want to move into a second stage, OK? And what this European Union has done is they thought about what about having a common area where the same currency, the same money will be used for transactions. So you move into a higher level of agreement. You move from a trade agreement to a monetary agreement. And in a monetary agreement, what you're doing is you have a common monetary policy. Now, what is the impact? What is the implication of a common monetary policy? Make like common legislation also. OK, but that means, in fact, that what you're going to be doing is I'm going to be recognizing the euro as the currency in circulation. And that's the method of payment that I would use. OK, so the euro becomes a single currency for 17 countries. For each one of those countries, what happens in terms of their monetary policy? Can it be independent? 
Okay, so the one thing that you are doing every time that you're reaching an agreement, every time that you reach something as an agreement, is you are, if you want to put it that way, giving away a little bit of sovereignty in something that you had before and you're not going to be able to do by yourself anymore. So every single trade agreement, every single monetary agreement, every single thing that you do as a nation with other nations implies that you are losing a little bit of freedom in your policies. Okay? That implies I no longer can go to my central bank and ask the central bank to print money to finance my deficit. Because there is no one single bank, it is the bank of the overall region. Okay? So you now have a central bank, which is called the European Central Bank, and it's located in Germany. And what it does, it really defines the monetary policy for the whole region. The problem that you will see now happening, and we will get into detail on those things, is as the European Union countries got into these several levels of integration, and they went from the simplest level of integration into what is becoming more and more complicated levels of integration, they forgot to do something. These 17 countries in the Euro area, what they did is they agreed on a monetary policy, but they did not agree in a fiscal common policy. Okay? Yes, there was the Maastricht Treaty. What is the Maastricht Treaty? It is the blueprint made by the European countries. If you want to integrate with me, there are certain conditions that you have to define and you have to accept. One of the conditions that they had defined originally was any country that is reaching an agreement to enter into the European Union will have to have a public sector deficit no larger than 3% of GDP. This was a constraint that the Maastricht Treaty was imposing on every country that wanted to join the European Union. Okay? Because many countries played games with this number, you ended up in a situation where you had a common monetary policy, meaning you had a common, in many ways, interest rate policy, lending policies, circulation of money policies. And so, all of a sudden, many of these economies had access to large amounts of credit coming from Germany and other countries. And because interest rates were a little bit higher in countries like Greece, it was much more desirable for a bank, for a commercial bank, to make loans in Greece than to make loans in Germany. Because you will be able to charge larger interest rate to the Greeks than they will do to Germans, okay? And because it was a common currency, I was making a loan in euros. I was not making a loan in Greek drachmas. And therefore, yes, I make a loan in drachmas, and then I am concerned about the exchange rate. You think of the way things are happening right now in Mexico. If you're a foreigner right now and you want to make investment, not in hardware, okay, but going into the monetary instruments in Mexico, you will come and you will go where? Where will you make your investment? You don't want to make an investment in the, I'm sorry? Yeah, but I have to say in English. Uh, Stock exchange, okay? So what you will do is you will go to the stock exchange. And what you're going to do in the stock exchange, you're going to walk into that one, and you're going to say, let me see what is there, okay? So there are government debt. Okay, those are bonds from the Mexican government, which are issued, and you go to the stock exchange and you buy bonds. When you buy bonds, Are these bonds denominated in dollars or in pesos? Yeah. If it is Mexico and I'm issuing bonds inside my own stock market, inside my economy, I'm going to be issuing government debt in peso denominated bonds. Now, I have a bond, duration 10 years, and interest rate is going to be what? First question, is the interest rate in bonds of the Mexican debt going to be higher or lower than 
bonds in the United States debt, which is denominated in dollars. Why do you think it's higher? It's more risky. Why do you think it's more risky? Because we are not as solid as the US economy. So you feel that way, yeah? If you believe in that, and you believe really that's going to be the case, then you're going to be asking higher interest rate so I can put my money into Mexican government bonds rather than United States government bonds. That's what's called what? That spread, that difference, is called what? What, what do you call that? What is the name of that index? If there is a risk in there, I'm going to be charging an extra interest rate. That spread is the risk of the country. Yeah? So when you make country risk analysis, what you do is you say, well, do I trust or I don't trust the Mexican government? Well, a little bit. Okay. So if I'm going to be lending money to the Mexican government, I will be asking a spread. That spread is going to be very important because what it will imply is what is the difference that the Mexican government has to pay to get bonds in the market being bought by investors in the market? What market? The international market. Okay. So we now participate in the international market. We go outside Mexico and we place bonds in the big international market of financial. And they will be asking this spread, and that's the country risk. And the country risk is going to be a number. Now, that number right now for Mexico is somewhere around, depends on the day, somewhere between 125, 135 basis points. What's a basis point? What's a base point? Just seem like you know. What's a base point? If you're in international business, you need to know all these things, okay? I know this is international finance, but in the end, what we're talking about is very simple. This is really what investors will be asking from the Mexican government to buy a bond from Mexico rather than a bond from the United States, assuming the same duration, 10 years, okay? So what I will be asking them is this, and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be making a measure of the risk. There are agencies who determine those risks, and they simply say, well, the risk of investing in Mexican bonds rather than in the United States bond, which is the benchmark, is going to be 125 points. If it is 125 base points, that means 1.25 interest rate higher. Okay? So every 100 base points is one point of interest rate. So if I am the American government and I put bonds in the market 10 years at 1.9% for an investor to buy an equivalent bond from the Mexican government, it will be asking not 1.9, but that plus 125. So they will be asking 315. Okay? So the interest rate in dollar denominated Mexican debt in the market is going to be whatever the American bond is, which is denominated in dollars, obviously, plus this spread, which is the country risk, determined at some point. Okay? So when the Mexican government goes ahead and says, I just placed $1 billion, $10 billion in government bonds 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, what you will see is that it's going to be a certain spread between the same equivalent bond in the United States and the bond in Mexico. Everything I said right now is in dollar denominated, okay? The Mexican government is putting bonds outside and is saying, I'm going to be putting these bonds in dollar denominated terms. So I will have to pay dollars. I'm not paying pesos, I'm paying dollars. Then the government of Mexico says, but I don't want to do that. I want to place bonds in my domestic market, the stock market of Mexico, and I want to put those bonds in peso denominated terms. You are a foreign investor. You are coming from outside Mexico looking at this option. And you look at the option, you say, okay, inside the Mexican government, 
When I see the Mexican government placing bonds in Mexico, in the stock market of Mexico, it has to have a certain amount of what? Of interest rate that I will be interested in. Yeah. What is the benchmark in Mexico right now for government bonds in pesos? Well, it is approximately right now 4.5 to 4.8 points, OK? So the interest rate is about 4.5 to 4.8. This, again, is the benchmark in the Mexican market, OK? Do you want to know what's going to happen with the monetary policy of a country? Go and look at what are the interest rate that the government pays in its bond. Because that's going to be what? That's going to be the safest investment instrument that you can find if you are a financial investor. Who makes these investments? Well, you are young, but you will become old. So as you become old, there is a very important element for you in your life, which are you are 40. Yeah? You don't even know about that, but this is going to be very important in your lives. Why? Because this is going to be the instrument that you will be using to have a pension when you end up your productive life. So you all will have an Afore. And the Afore are investment funds. If you're going to think in a different way, this is the pension fund for you over time. OK? Whereas in the past, we used the Seguro Social. And the Seguro Social was the one that was supposed to pay our pension when we, as I say, graduated at the end of your life. OK? What's going to happen to you now is there is going to be an Afore, which is an outside investment fund to which you subscribe. And so you can go to BBWB. You can go to, well, actually, you cannot go anymore to BBWB because they already sold it to Banorte. So you have to go to Banorte and say, I want to participate in this investment fund. I'm going to place all my savings from now till I retire. And you are the one who will be investing for me. I'm willing to pay you certain commission, but I am hoping that you will be getting me the maximum benefit in terms of return on my investment. OK. The minimum that that company is going to be making if they invest everything in government bonds is going to be 4.5 to 4.8 today. OK? What is the risk of that? Basically, zero. Okay. The risk of default on that is very, very low because it's a government bond. And the government can invent many ways to pay. So normally, you will say, this is the lowest interest rate I'm going to be having in the Mexican market for either investment or for loans I want to make. All of these things I'm telling you is because now we are talking about two separate markets. One is the international market, and the other one is the national market. In the international market, the one benchmark is going to be the US bond. Denominated in dollars, interest rate they pay around 1.9. It can go as low as 1.5. Interest rates right now in the world are very low. If Mexico decides to issue a bond in dollar denominated terms, then I am going to be adding at least 1.25 because that's the country risk that I see today. That's what the markets are telling me. The difference in risk between a bond from the United States and a bond in Mexico, same denomination, dollar denominated, is 125. OK, this is not the course of financial, you know, but we can go into why, how you determine that. But this is what it is right now in the market. So given that combination, the Mexican government knows that if they want to issue a bond in international markets in dollar denominated terms, they will have to pay 3.15 minimum. Did the interest rate is influenced by, uh, for example, uh, Moody's or Fitch? Yeah. yeah. They are the ones who will make that. They are the ones that will come to you and say, the country risk of this country, I'm going to classify its debt. And the Mexican debt right now is classified BBB, which implies. Good investment, but not excellent. I mean, in fact, right now, in terms of the world, we are very good. 
were really excellent. But despite that, what the classification says is you are not triple A. In fact, the United States is no longer triple A, okay? So the largest and the best denomination in terms of classification is triple A. Triple A is the lowest, most secure investment you can make. We are triple B. That means we are great investment. All these classifications are important because that's the way that pension funds decide where to invest, what, how to invest, okay? But once you reach that point, you know that if the Mexican government wants to come to the market because they are classified different from the classification of the United States bond, then they will have to pay a premium. That premium is 1.25, which is the equivalent of the benchmark that's been determined by the Morgan bonds in this case, or there are many other things. And that's 1.25. So how much does the United States pay? 1.9. How much does the Mexican government have to pay for an equivalent bond? 3.15. Assuming these numbers, okay? I was just going to say that right now in one rate change, they were going to take one of the um, A because of the government debt. Yeah, yeah. The United States lost the AAA, but you know, regardless of that, we all, you know, the immediate reaction here was, yeah, the United States, well, you know, maybe not. If I am thinking about who is more capable of paying in the long run right now, I would say Mexico. Why? Because the Americans are fighting all this discussion about what should be the debt limit that they will have and all these other discussions. What happens if all of a sudden in May of this year, well, I'm, I'm assuming that they will be approving change between March and May, but in May of this year, the political situation in the United States so deteriorated that the United States Congress decides they will not agree on an increase in the debt limit of the United States unless President Obama really reduces the expenses. If he does that, if that fight comes and it really happens, then all bets are off. Who's going to pay? Who knows? Because you have no capacity to put more debt and you will start non-paying many things. So in, in a way, what we're talking right now is the nice discussion in the United States is very important to Mexico. Because if all of a sudden you have a problem in the United States and they really don't reach a political agreement, we may all be in the soup, okay? We may all be in trouble. So, why was I presenting you these things? Because I'm trying to make you see two things. This is the domestic market. This is the international market, okay? Right now, I can participate in both because I decided that I am a globalized country and economy. This is one of the things that's happening in the world in the past 40 years. As this possibility of my putting bonds either in foreign markets or in domestic market arises, I can participate in the international structure of financing. That means foreign investors will be looking at my country where they can really make investment possibilities. So, I look at dollar-denominated bonds from Mexico and the United States, I'm asking for a 125 premium. They're both in dollar denominations. Ah, but I go into the internal market of Mexico and I make an investment in government bonds in peso denominated terms. Am I going to charge them 315? What's the key difference here? These bonds, same government, same period, 10 years, are denominated in what? Pesos. Since they are in pesos, they are not dollars. They are pesos. So the problem I'm facing right now is, what if there is a devaluation of the peso? If the peso is right now 3 to 1, which of course is not, you know, and the peso goes to 2 to 1, what happened in terms of dollars? Dollars. 
This is called a revaluation, yeah? The peso is revaluing. It went from three pesos per dollar to two pesos per dollar. It's more expensive to buy pesos. But you went to the market when it was three to one, and now the market gives you two to one. Are you better off? You're a foreigner. Are you better off or you're worse off? Hmm? Think about it. I'm a foreigner. I came with my dollar, they gave me three pesos. Okay? I make my investment. The peso goes two to one. I have three pesos. How many pesos do I need to buy a dollar? Two. I have one extra peso left. What do I do with that extra peso? I buy dollars. How much can I buy? Okay. So now, my investment, just because there was an appreciation of the peso, went from one to $1.50. dollars. This is the effect of the exchange rate. How much did I win because of the exchange rate? Appreciation. Half of what I invested. 50%. That's a nice investment. Yeah? So I go to this country and I say, well, let me see. What is the possibility of the appreciation of the peso dollar exchange rate? Very high. Invest there. Because it's going to go up. I'm going to get more money just because of that. Ah, but the opposite happened. I got into the market when it was one to two. There is a devaluation of the peso, and it's now one to three. How much did I lose in my investment just because of the depreciation? Yeah. OK, so I'm going to invest in Mexico. I'm going to invest in pesos. Am I going to charge 315? There is another risk, which is the risk that I'm facing right now, the exchange rate risk. Okay? It can go one way or the other. It can go positive on me, it can go negative on me. But there is a risk. I'm not concerned about the positive, that's nice, I'm winning. But I'm very concerned about the negative, because I'm losing. So exchange rate plays a role in these decisions of investments. All of a sudden, these guys come and say, you know what? There is no exchange rate issue in your investments because everything is now is euro denominated. But, but the country is called Greece. Yeah, but you know, you lend them in euros, they pay you in euros. But the country is Spain. You lend them in euros, you get your money in euros. The country is Germany. You lend them in euros, you get your money in euros. All of a sudden, by creating the monetary area, what you have is the possibility of anyone who is making investments in that region, coming from one country to the other of that region, knowing that the one thing they have no problem with anymore is this exchange rate issue. Okay? And so what it becomes, then it becomes a country issue. It becomes just this part. Once I did that, because you took away from me the exchange rate risk, I'm going to start buying bonds now. Between Germany and a country called Greece, are the two economies as strong as the German, or is the German stronger than the Greek? Okay, that's the general assumption. Sometimes maybe wrong, but yes. In this particular case, it is true because the production capacity, the saving capacity, etc., of the country. So I'm going to be asking the Greeks for a larger interest payment than what I will be asking the Germans. Okay? Country risk. Do I have to worry about the exchange rate risk? Not anymore. So I'm going to worry only about this thing. Again, last class we talked about the fundamentals. When I look at the fundamentals of the Greek government, I say they are very strong. Because they are telling me that they have a 3% deficit as proportion of GDP. Which means that they can get money, lend money, obtain money, and they will be able to repay. Ah, but if they were showing me numbers which were wrong and they really had a 10% GDP deficit as proportion of GDP, 
It's very different. This from this. The country risk is not 125. The country risk should have been, you know, 10 points more. But I didn't see this because I was playing this game and they were showing me numbers. So I made lots of investments in these countries. And people were very happy because they were getting cheap credit from outside. They were buying houses, they were doing many things. The economies were booming. This is called the consumer boom. You know, the Spaniards were happy buying houses. One piso in Madrid, one piso in the beach, one piece all over the place, because I get debts and the interest rate is low and I can pay for that. Until you couldn't pay, okay? Because I'm in a monetary policy, but I don't have the common fiscal policy, the problem that I found out later on was, this had a fundamental flaw. And that fundamental flaw was the fact that you didn't have a common fiscal policy. This is the problem of the euro right now. This is the problem of the euro area. This is what they will have to discuss. And what they have to discuss right now is how are we going to be distributing the losses? Because the profits are gone. So now every country has to decide how much am I going to pay from this amount that is being lost? And that's the big discussion in Europe. Who's going to pay? So we all have a nice party. We all are with hangover the next day. And the question is, how many medicines for the hangover do we have? Oh, we only have 17. We only have 10. And I'm going to take two. So you only have nine. How do you distribute the nine between yourselves? It's your problem. Some of you are going to have a tremendous headache, and the other one is going to be able to minimize that. And so the ones with tremendous headache, called Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, are saying, wait a minute, man. I cannot have this hangover, OK? I need a reduction of my hangover. And that implies you will have to have some. You, Germany, you, France, you, the ones who have money. This is the fight in Europe right now. Add to that internal political situations, the boss is going to be fun, OK? OK, so what did we learn last time? We learned that trade leads towards the so-called convergence law or to what Samuelson, his famous paper, called factor price equalization theorem, OK? Which indeed implies, in the long run, if you really allow trade to take place, and if the conditions of a free market are determined, over the long run, payment to all factors of production will be practically the same. So labor will be getting wages which will be equalizing each other over time among countries. We know that this is true because we see what's happening right now in China. Okay? In China, what we see right now is wages increasing and therefore China losing the competitiveness that had gotten from low wages. This implies, therefore, that yes, there is a certain factor as we have more and more trade, things start equalizing each other. So you may have some advantages which are in a way artificial at the beginning, but those advantages are going to be equalizing over time. And so we will be looking in the next two or three classes at what is called comparative advantage. What is the advantage that you really have as a country? Where is that you are more productive? Because if it is wages, wages will be increasing over time. And so it cannot be wage, it has to be productivity. Oh, but at the beginning it is wage. Yes, at the beginning it was wages. They were very low compared to Mexico or other countries, particularly the United States. And therefore, lots of production moved into China. As that production moved into China, they began hiring people, they began providing them with skills, and they started asking for higher salaries. So slowly what's happening right now in China is you have the same problem that we have. Theoretically, you can read the paper of Samuelson, okay? This is one of the papers for which he got the Nobel Prize. But theoretically, what you will do is you will go into the factor price equalization theory. All factors will be reaching the same value, okay? 
but we all know that it takes a long time. And as I said in the last class, the problem with this is you're going to have a migration of industry. So it moves from Mexico to China, from China to Vietnam, from Vietnam to Bangladesh. Finally, it will be equal at some point. But there is always, this, you know, unfortunately, because we have this problem in the world of lack of employment, we will end up with this industry migrating from Mexico, textile, to China, from China to Vietnam, from Vietnam to Bangladesh, from Bangladesh to Honduras, Honduras. As long as you can do that, this is going to happen. Industries will migrate, looking for the lower cost possibilities, and salaries will increase. Second thing is, trade benefits are not shared equally between nations or between people within each nation. Okay? Yeah, there is a large middle class in China today. About 400 million people have been taken out of poverty. But there is still about 400 million people in poverty in China. So one of the problems is, yes, things work, things get better, but the distribution of the benefits of trade does not necessarily go to everybody the same way. Over time, oh yeah, well, you know, over time we will all be dead and there will be someone who are our descendants. We don't want to wait that. We want to do it with our own generation. And so one of the problems that you will be facing is, because trade benefits are not shared equally between nations or between people, there is going to be this struggle between the haves and the have-nots for the benefits of trade. Then, that implies outsourcing of offshoring, which is what companies do when they put their productions outside. They became very important for competitiveness because as one company, as I have free trade, my first competitor inside says, look, the only way that I'm going to have a cheaper product is if I go with my technology into China, use the wages of China, they produce the goods, and I bring the goods from China to the United States market, and I will bring it at a lower price than my competitor who is producing in the United States. Okay? Question mark, transportation cost. That's all. If my transportation cost allows me to do that, then... I'm going to set shop somewhere else, offshoring. Or I'm going to be passing part of my production outside, outsourcing. But what I'm doing then is I'm trying to find ways to reduce the cost of production of my goods. We saw that in Boeing. We saw that in the cars. We see those things happening. Ah, there are other problems. Yeah, but in the meantime, I'm going to do that. As I do that, it becomes very important for a company to define how much is going to be outsourcing, how much is going to be offshoring. Okay. Uh, but if I do these things, I better make sure that I can bring the product into my country without the tariff. Because if I go and I do outsourcing, offshoring, and then all of a sudden someone comes and says, yeah, well, any product that is produced in China is going to have a 50% tariff, then I'm going to lose all my advantage because of the loss of wages. Okay? And, of course, because benefits are not shared equally, there is going to be a pressure group asking me to raise tariffs for those products. And then it becomes this point. Internal politics and pressure groups whose interests are affected by trade can lead to domestic policies which distort business strategies of foreign companies wishing to do business there. Okay? Because there is going to be a reaction. Hey, come on. I am the one who stayed in the United States. The Buy American Trade Act tells me that you should buy American. Don't buy. Hey, but this is made by an American company. No, no, no. It's made by Chinese, okay? And so what you have is what we call last class the isms, okay? And that means a lot of people using political isms. Nationalism is that. For what? They are doing that, and therefore you are a company, you want to participate in international trade, what you need is rules and the respect of those rules. Okay? I don't want to try to figure out whether Chavez is going to die or not. I want to make sure that if I do business in Venezuela, regardless of what happens to Chavez, I'm going to have a return on my investment. And so I want rules. I have a question about... Um 
about the trade because, uh, well, I think that when you have trade, and I, I don't know if you invest, as you said, in China, so, mm -hmm. like, uh, you also generate, like, uh, work for the local people as well. So, well, if those uh, investments were not there, maybe, like, people wouldn't have that opportunity to, exactly. to work and stuff. So, why, um, like, how is it that the, like, the shares are, no, like, the benefits are not equally shared? Like, I because I the people who get a job are going to have a better standard of living. The people who don't have a job are going to have a worse standard of living. If there was a company that I had already there, and this company is displaced because I'm moving my production to some other country, that people is going to lose, and the Chinese are going to win. So the problem you're going to be facing is two things. One is, all the Americans who are losing jobs to the Chinese are going to say, what is the benefit of free trade? I don't see any benefit. I see a loss of my job. So that's not a benefit. I'm sorry, I don't want that. And so if you are sending the product to be produced in China and then to be consumed in the United States, what you are doing in effect is you are taking away my market. I am a hard-working American or Mexican citizen. I've been doing my job. And all you are doing is you are exploiting people from all other parts of the world. Exploitation should not be. This will be fair if you pay them the same salary that you pay us. And let's see who is more productive. Okay? And so you as a company are going to say, you know what, I don't care. These guys over there produce the same as you do and they charge half. I can reduce, therefore, the cost of production. I can bring the product into the United States at half the price or whatever, once I have this. And therefore, tough luck, lose your job. Well, the guys who lose their job, they are not benefiting. Okay? Ah, but they are. How? See, this is the trick of trade. This is, if you are a free trader, which most of you, I hope, will be at the end of the class, but you are not free traders at the beginning of the class. Because it goes against nature. Because what it says is, if you have free trade, you're going to lose your job. Do you want to lose your job? OK. So should we have free trade? If you're going to lose your job, you're going to say no. OK? Of course, if I'm going to get a job, I'm going to say yes. And so the Americans are going to say to the Chinese, fine. Then you have 1.3 billion people out of which, because of this process, we have now 400 million middle-income people. Let my products now be sold in China. And the Chinese are going to say, no, because that will affect my production. Oh, wait, wait. Either you believe in free trade or you don't believe in free trade. If you believe in free trade, you believe both ways, both directions. If you don't, you don't. At the beginning of the class, you said that Brazil is going to grow. Well, that depends. Because what happened to Brazil in the past 10 years is they grew because there was a commodity boom in the world. And so the products that they were selling had an increase in price. And that increase in price, which is called terms of trade in their favor, they won, gave them a lot of extra income that they spent in many programs, social programs and what have you. If those programs were not invested in productive things, they were all consumed. I'm not going to say that's bad. All I'm going to say is they were consumed. They were not invested. If they were consumed, when that money disappears because now international prices are going down, because China is no longer growing fast, because the United States is no longer growing fast, because Europeans are no longer growing fast, then they don't have that extra income. They are, have still the products, except the price went down. Now what are they going to do? Because they got used to spending this extra money. OK? It's like if you go home and your dad decides, because he really likes you, that he will give you 1,000 pesos more to spend. And you go and you spend that money. And you believe that your dad is going to give you those 1,000 pesos every single month for the rest of your time in the university. OK? But your dad was just kind of nice for one month. 
And then the second month, he decided, mm, I don't have as much money as I had last month, so I'm going to be sending Yamel what she was having before. Except Yamel now got used to a thousand pesos more. Now you have to make the adjustment, okay? Brazil is going to have to make the adjustment. That implies that many industries that were financed because they had these tremendous trade benefits given the change in price of commodities are going to have to adjust. It's going to be very tough for them. So they probably will not be growing at the rate that they say they will be growing. Okay? But you have to analyze those in a different aspect. This is what happens when you don't understand what's happening with trade. So trade is good, yes. Why is trade good? We're going to see that later on. But it is basically because it will help the consumer. Because in fact, even if I lose my job, the fact that I now have clothes at half the price makes me better off as a consumer. Uh, but if you don't have the income, those are the discussions of these people. But you don't have the income. Internal politics will get on the way. Okay? So what we're going to be facing now is the policy implications. Despite my conviction, I'm saying our because I hope that it convince you, but you know, our conviction based on theoretical and empirical evidence that economies and countries gain from trading, we have also reached the conclusion that a number of factors have the potential to reduce these gains or to skew their distribution among nations and people in a nation. There are things I can do that will skew who gets more from trade. And so the question will be, okay, if this is a win-win, you should not be concerned. But someone is going to win more than the other one. And so you will say, no, 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 it has to be fair. Equal sharing. No, there is no equal sharing. Tough luck. Okay? So what we will do is we will have to understand that many factors inside the country or in the international trade will skew the distribution of the gains from trade. And that skewing is what makes people upset. Because you see one getting more and you are getting less. Yeah, but as long as you are gaining from that trade, you are going to be better off than where you were before. Yeah, but I mean, why the Americans are going to have everything? They don't get everything. They only get 80%. Well, that's the point. I want 80% and the Americans 20 Well, the way the consumer market is defined, they will be getting more benefits because they have a larger consumption market. But that's not fair. They should pay fairly. Well, that was not the point. The point was that they will pay less. Yeah? So many poor countries will also have another problem. Many of them face supply, const supply constraints that make it difficult to increase trade even when market access is not an obstacle. They don't have the roads. They don't have facilities. They don't have the ports. And as they don't have those things, they simply cannot benefit from trade. Okay? Significant costs may be generated by adjusting a country's production structure to trade liberalization. Yes. If I had a, a protected economy and also I opened that economy, the system of production of that economy, which was based on the fact that they were protected, is going to suffer. So closing of companies is going to happen. And as closing of companies happens, people lose their jobs. But I'm saying that trade is good for the country. In the short run, the impact may be negative. In the long run, it will be positive. Yeah, well, you know, by then I may be already starved to death. Because what trade does is rearrange winners and losers in a country. This is what it does. And then, of course, there is another problem that we are facing in the modern world. Technology changes too fast. As technology changes too fast, it is making more and more difficult to predict who wins and who loses. Okay? If you discuss what was going to be the situation of Apple six months ago, you will have said that they were really in a role, they will be making a lot of money. All of a sudden, you go today and you find out that Samsung is beating Apple in the selling of many of these smart telephones. Why? Because they made the switch finally, they made the right investment, they are getting 
into the market at a lower price. As they do that, Apple is not selling as much as they were selling before. As Apple doesn't sell as many i5 phones as they thought they would, the input chain gets reduced. As the input chain gets reduced, China is losing in the production of iPhones. Uh, but Vietnam is producing Samsung. OK, so Vietnam is winning. Technology changes, and the quickness with which is happening, this change in technology, is making it more and more difficult to figure out who's going to win, who's going to lose from trade. OK? Because you may think that you're going to lose because you brought Audi into Puebla. Who knows? Maybe in five years' time, no one really wants an Audi. OK? And so what's going to happen is, Today, it seems a great win for Puebla. We brought the planta of Audi into Puebla. But if no one wants Audis in three years, because they all want, I don't know, Mercedes Benz or what have you, then maybe the one who won is the one who really got the plant of Mercedes Benz. Okay? Technology makes it very difficult for us. But in addition, if I am not an innovative country, it's even more difficult. So policies will have to respond to that. If in this country we do not invest in research and development, it's going to be very difficult for the country to be a winner in trade in the long run. Okay? What I'm saying to you is all of these things will imply policies. But what I'm also saying to you is because of all these things, for a company to really be able to make investments and the right business strategy in the international market, it requires certainty in the rules of trade. Because if in addition to all this, you change the rules on trade on me every single week, I have no idea what can I do. How do you attract Audi to make investment in Puebla? You think it was because we're very nice in Puebla? Poblanos are nice and so on. Yes, they speak German. So I told Audi that I will give them a trading center, I'm sorry, a training center where they will be able to train people and that I will be providing, I, the government, will be providing the grounds, the building, the people to train them. I am subsidizing the training of these people. I, <coughs> government. Second, I'm going to give you the land. You can come to this place. How much do you need? Well, I need about, you know, oh, what's the size of this university? 85 hectares. I need 85 hectares. Why? Just because I like the university, so I want the same size. Fine. 85 hectares. Um, what else? I don't want to pay taxes on, the, on this and that. Very specific <laughs> tax that we have to pay and they don't. I'm upset. Is the 2% on what is called in Mexico wages, you know? Wage tax. Every wage that we pay, we have to pay 2% for a tax to the state government. They won't. For how long? 10 years. So as you start looking at these things, you say, wait a minute, you got all these things, and that's what made you take the decision to come to Puebla. Yes. OK. When is the plan going to be finished? In five years. Who's going to be governor in five years' time? Who knows? Yeah? That's the answer. So. Given that we don't know, what if that person comes and says, I don't like these things. I don't want to lose 2% income on this and that, I don't want to do this, thing, so I'm going to change the rules. What would you do then? You say, wait a minute. When I made up my mind and I started investing and coming to Puebla and doing the things, these are the things that you told me I will get. When I put all those things into my evaluation, Puebla came ahead of Guanajuato, this and that. That's the reason, or one of the reasons why I invested in Puebla rather than in Guanajuato. Are you changing me now the rules of the game? When the plant is there, I made $500 million investments. This is not fair. This is exactly what a country does with a big companies. I don't know, 
they say you're gonna pay lower taxes. I don't know, you can leave whatever you want, whatever you want. I don't know, some. What is the problem? It's good for, for Puebla. That's no problem. The problem is what happens if I change the rules? I'm the governor and I don't like it. And I just walk the past. New problem, my friend. Now you made investment, you have here all your machines. Do you want to take them back? Take them back. What do you do? You're a company, what do you do? I trick you. Ah. Well, I don't know. Tough if luck. It, if I generated a good profit, maybe uh, I will pay the uh, 2% of tax. Yeah, but imagine, imagine that what I did is I was government A and it became government B. Government A said to you, this is what you will get. When you make your estimate and your business strategy, you make it with those parameters. And that's what you tell your shareholders. And that's what makes the value of your company what it is. So otherwise, your shares will be lower. Yeah? You won't be a company, $50 billion company, it will be a $48 billion company. I have no idea. Okay? If all of a sudden I come to you and I say, this Profits you told me you will be making in the next 20 years are not going to happen because I'm going to charge you this, I'm going to charge you that, I'm going to collect from you the land, and therefore the investment in your factory now will provide you with less profits. Then what you're going to say to me is, wait a minute. I have an obligation with my shareholders, and I told them that we'll be making a profit of this based upon the following assumptions. Assumptions that were provided by you. And now you are changing. Well, wait, 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 wait. It was not I. It was Pedro. Wait, 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 wait. I deal with the government of Puebla. I don't deal with Rafael Moreno Valle or Luis Ernesto Herbes. Okay? And so what do I need to make sure that I make the investment with you? What do I need? Certainty. Certainty. I don't, Certainty. I don't know. What was the agreement with Audi? But Audi must know that in five years the political is going to change. And so therefore, what do you want as a company? Security? Yeah, you want certainty. So, what do you want? How do you want that certainty to be? You want rules of the game that do not change just because someone came and said, my name is Luis, it's not Rafael. Tough luck. He says, wait, 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 wait. I didn't make a business deal with Luis or Rafael. I made a business deal with the state of Puebla or the government of Mexico. Yeah, well, tough luck. So, what you want is something which is very important. You want to make sure that the rules will remain, okay? And you want that because, let me show you here how difficult it is to know where a product was made in today's world. How do you know where the products you buy come from? When today the traditional label made in is outdated. Nowadays, many products are built out of a supply chain that crosses several national borders. Items like electronic or transportation equipment are the result of a network of factors in different countries involved in the production, delivery and sale to the final consumers. In this simple scheme, we see that many steps are required to transform raw materials into parts and components then final goods before they arrive in the customer's basket. Today, this process is truly global. However, the label made in refers only to the very final stage of the production. This can be very misleading. For example, let's take a mobile phone. It is designed in Finland and exported from China to the United States. Thanks to a study made by the Research Institute of the Finnish Economy, we can see how this telephone comes together on a global supply chain. This telephone is made of 600 individual components and other inputs such as software licenses. 
the hardware components account for 33% of the mobile retail price. The software design, mainly licenses and copyrights, represent 4% of the retail price. 47% of this price is due to research and administrative tasks. The actual assembly of the telephone accounts for only 2% of the total value. And other tasks, mainly distribution and retailing, represent 15% of the final price paid by the consumers. Now, let's observe where the value added comes from. Administrative tasks are done in Europe, mainly Finland and the UK. The hardware components are the result of tasks conducted in Europe, Asia and the United States. The software design comes from Finland, UK, USA, Germany and Japan. Final assembly and mass manufacturing are done in Finland and China. Other tasks are completed in Finland, the United States and Asia. If we look at how much value added each part of the world has brought to this process, we get this. Europe has 51% of the value added. This is because it is dominant in the branding, development, design and administration. 28% of the value added comes from North America, where the phone is sold. 16% comes from Asia. And 5% comes from the rest of the world. The conclusion is that it is very difficult to attribute a nationality to a telephone. Is it Finnish? Is it Chinese? We see that many countries participated in this process, which created employment and income for many people from different nationalities across different regions. But today, the phone appears on trade statistics as being made in China, because China was the last step in this long global process. Made in the world is therefore better adapted to the present reality of global production. Measuring where the value added comes from is today very important. It will help governments and analysts understand better the relationship between trade and development. It will put also into a more realistic perspective bilateral trade imbalances between countries. is what did we learn from the video. And what we learned from the video are these things. One, value added counts. If you look at the result, the final result of that fund, the fact that it was designed, licensed, administrative costs in Finland, Germany, made the largest amount of the benefits gone into Europe. 50 some percent, okay? And then as you do other things, you will get less and less and less benefits from trade. This is the whole point of who gains from trade, okay? Development administration count, marketing and retailing count, and the final assembly of product in a country does not necessarily imply that the product was really made there. Outsourcing and offshoring. This company, Nokia, what it's doing is sending for the final assembly into China. So the Chinese export the product and they say that they sold the phone which is worth $20 or 200 whatever. When in fact, all the amount that was left in China is not going to be more than 20, one-tenth of the total value. So gains from trade in the world that we're talking right now are very different to measure from the simple idea that look at that, how powerful China is. In fact, what China is doing in many ways is simply assembling the final thing and getting the lowest amount of money from the product because they have the lowest proportion of value added done in that country. Outsourcing offshoring became very important, but production fragmentation also carries costs. Okay? So what the companies are doing is they are fragmenting their production process. This is what it means, really. You are sending all these things outside, and then you better be sure that it comes back correctly 
In the end, you have separate production stages and you need to coordinate and monitor this. This is exactly what's happening right now to Boeing with 787. The biggest problem of the plane is not in the fuselage, is not in the landing gear, is not in the engines, it is in a battery which leaks. Why did they use that battery? Because it was the lightest possible battery. Because it's lithium creates problems for the company. And because lithium is very unstable, if they don't do it correctly, the problem that you are facing is the same problem that many of you may have had with your computers. When all of a sudden you have your computer, and you really got very hot. And as the computer became very hot because you were using your battery, and the battery is a lithium battery, same problem, except computers have a safe shot program that what they do right now is when it really gets very hot, the computer turns off. Ah, oh, yeah, well, you know, you get upset, you may yell at the computer, you can do many things, but nothing happened. But if you're in a plane and it shuts down in the air because it's hot, you are going to be dead, okay? So you cannot do that, and that's the reason why they now stopped all the flights until they find out exactly what the problem with our lithium batteries are. They are about this size, okay? And they are stopping the whole plane. So one of the things that you have is that you have problems of transportation, communication costs, insurance costs, and other connecting service costs that will have to be into the equation. Why I'm telling you these things? This is a class for what I'm hoping will be international business students, which will become international business people, okay? So everything has to be related to what will you do in your company as you look at the possibilities in terms of moving around. First thing you need in your company is give me rules of the game which are certain, that cannot be changed by Luis getting in the place of Rafael, okay? Because if you do that, then I cannot plan. So I will go to a place where the rules of the game are being respected. The problem is, if the rules of the game are always on a national basis, and I am an international company like the one that you saw right there, that has many places where it does production, then it is a big problem because what I need is I need to assure that the China rules of the game are what they are, the Finnish rules of the game as they are, the German rules of the game because I am going to be producing my goods using things from 20 countries, from 10 countries, from 5 countries. So one-on-one -on -one is no longer what I want. What I want is a global system of rules. One that I can trust. One that I can say, no matter who's going to be in government in Russia, if I make an investment in Russia, which is part of a product that has been produced in 20 countries other than Russia, I will be sure that the Russians will respect the rules of the game. For what? For that particular input into my production process. Otherwise, I cannot operate. I can't operate. But what's the purpose of the products saying where they were made if all the companies are outsourcing and offshoring? It doesn't really matter because it was also yeah. made in so many other... It doesn't matter. But what matters for you as a company is wherever I'm going to be doing business, Meaning by that, if my production process goes through seven different countries, I want to make sure that the agreements I have for my investments in each one of those countries will hold. Because if one of those agreements do not hold, then my whole production process is going to be affected. Even if the other six countries respect the rules, if this country doesn't, I'm in trouble. Okay? And so what's happening really is commerce is becoming complex. So simple rules were simple, okay? If I will simply go and say, I'm going to produce everything in Puebla. So I set up shop in Puebla and everything is done in Puebla. Okay, I need then an agreement with that particular place. Simple. But because now I go all over the world and my inputs come from different places, 
my rules are not that simple because my process is not any longer simple. It's very complex. Yeah? And there are all kinds of things. If I'm going to go to China or if I'm going to go to Mexico and I'm going to be telling the Mexicans how my secret product is made, I want to make sure that they don't steal my ideas. That's called piracy. So I want to make absolutely certain in certain topics that there will be a respect of what? Property rights rules. Okay? Simple commerce, simple rules. Complex commerce needs complex rules. Okay? And so what's happening more and more is when everybody is selling in different ways, they will have to go into different processes. Okay? And so in 1947, when the GATT started, you know, the original agreement on trade, uh, it was very simple. And what is called the disciplines, meaning the things that will have to be defined as part of the ruling system, part of the legal system, were very simple. Okay, so we're going to be reducing tariffs. Oh, fine. This is what you do, and this is what you have to do. But today it's more and more complex. There are many other things that you want to make sure as a business enterprise that will be protected before you get into making investments or participating in a country. So what's happened is in the 21st century, we became more and more complex in trade. We just saw it right now. And as we become more and more complex, that means that we are imposing, we as a company, are imposing more and more rules. Don't you think that property rights are somehow against free trade? Well, that's the question. The question is, if I am going to have open information for everything, okay, then who's going to make the investments for innovation? Innovation costs. It's part of the production process. Creating a new product costs. If I'm going to make those investments, then if you want me, after I make the investment, to make that available to everybody, I'm going to say, no way. Okay? What I will do then is I will wait for you to make the investment, and I will steal it. Oh, but this is not really stealing because it is allowed. Ah, well, then you know what? There is no incentive for me to make that investment. Because the whole thing of the investment process is, I'm going to make a profit out of my investment. But if what you are telling me is the profit is going to be taken away from you because I'm going to pass on the information to everybody, then I'm going to say to you, I don't play the game. Okay? And then what it implies is, okay, then you put a system, your government put a system where you will be investing and we all will profit from that investment. That's fair. And then you will say as a country, wait, 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 wait. If I am Mexico and I make the investments, why should I give the results of my investment to the Chinese? My people first. Yeah? Complex processes require complex systems. So it's absolutely correct what you're saying. Okay? Normally you will say, I will say as an economist, okay? free competition, free markets. Yeah, well, if you do that, the question is, who is going to invest? Who's going to discover new goods? And so you go with the people and say, well, maybe we don't need any more goods. So let's leave as we are right now for the next 300 years. As a matter of fact, why don't we go back to our origins? Why do we don't become farmers? You wouldn't like that? No? Really? You would like to be you know, in the nature, have all these products which are organic, created, that will make you sure that you will die at 50 years of age but will have no cancer? Isn't that nice? What do you prefer? You prefer to live to 80 and die of cancer or you prefer to live until 50 and no cancer? I, I'm joking a little bit, okay? But what I'm saying to you is this discussion is really what's taking place right now between fair trade and free trade, okay? And it's becoming very complicated, particularly in what's called TRIPS, which are all the agreements on property rights. We will see all those things as we move. 
All I, I want to show you in this first section is why trade is good and what complexities are beginning to happen in trade. So that we know that, yes, it's evident that we need a trading system that has rules. And I need to figure out what those rules are. Now, we started with GATT, which was very simple. And now we have to look at a system that looks at this trade investment services nexus. OK? So otherwise, it won't work. So what you need as a company, as institutional arrangements, so that you can bring high quality, competitive price goods to the market, is at least these things. One, the sharing of tacit and explicit technology and intellectual property is facilitated by assurances that foreign knowledge capital owners will be traded fairly and their property rights will be respected. OK? This is the first thing. This is the whole business of piracy. I don't want someone to steal my idea. Okay? This is equivalent of how many of you will be willing to let your companion on right or left copy your responses in the exam when you knew that he or she didn't study? Who? You will accept it? Okay, so you're in trouble. Hmm? <laughs> Will you accept her to do that? Okay. So, if you don't accept in your own class one person to copy what you are responding and then getting 10 as you get 10, you got your 10, so what's wrong with that? Let the other person get their 10. Why not? Because the other is different. Because the person who's studying is making Make your effort than the other person it. It's just copy. But you got your 10 or not? Yes. It's not. It's don't, don't be envious. Come on. Yeah. I got me 10, but it's no like a cool way to see that the other person got the 10 oh, if on. he didn't step. But they didn't know anything anyway. So in the end, you know, and he or she doesn't. Isn't that nice? Why is it important? I know that it is, it is the sense that, gee, this is not fair. I studied and she didn't or he didn't. Why would I? Well, there is a lot of people who allow that to happen. I hope you don't. But the key question for you is the following. If I let that happen, when I finish my degree, he and I, she and I, will have exactly the same results. OK? And when a person comes and is very good in copying, he or she probably will have 10, and I probably will have 9.8. I'm assuming you are very good, OK? So as you go into that final grade, and I'm going to hire you, I'm going to look at your degree, and I will see all your course lists, and I will say, aha, uh -huh, she's very good, 9.8, but she is better, 10. Whom am I going to be hiring? Same university, same courses, different grades. So there is going to be an advantage for that person, which is not the right advantage, because he or she didn't earn it. OK, this is the whole point, OK? If I make the investment, if I discover things, why should I freely let it be to the rest? Ah, but this is the solution to cancer. But you're Pfizer. You invested $25 billion in the research program to find the vaccine against cancer. Gee, but you know, cancer is a terrible disease. Be nice guy. I'll tell you what, I'll give you $25 billion. Will you accept it? OK, so that's going to be a question that you will be facing in the world. The answer normally, I hope this will be your answer, is no. Why? Because I made the whole effort, the investment, everything. I want to reap the benefits from that investment. And if it took me $25 billion to bring this thing, I want to be at least able to make $2.5 billion profit on my investment. That's a 10% investment. It's not too high for the kind of thing that I did. But this means that many poor people are not going to be able to be saved in the next 10 years. 
These are difficult questions, okay? That, that way you could tell the World, world uh, Health Organization that all the countries could chip in and then give the company the money it wants for the vaccine. I hope that happens. I've been in many of these negotiations, okay? And we are all very selfish. NAFTA is one of these institutional arrangements, okay? I put this in question mark. Is it or is it not? So the questions that I send you in the first class are the questions that we're going to be answering next class, okay? On January 1, 1994, began the treaty. Immediately, it created the largest free trade area in the world, okay? $17 trillion worth of goods and services. It's a huge economy. All remaining duties and quantity restrictions were eliminated as a shell on January 1, 2008. The U.S. and Mexico agreed to establish procedures for accepting results from testing facilities in the territory of another NAFTA country for use in the conformity assessment of telecommunications equipment. This is another thing that happened that people don't focus on. All of a sudden, what we are finding out is, I do my things there, someone reviews that those things work, and I accept them in my country as ready to be used. I don't go through a testing process in Mexico, and vice versa. If I do the testing process in Mexico of a new product and I say it is good, the Americans will accept the product as if it is good. Okay? So in many products, that helps a lot because it allows the manufacturer to test a product only once and then have the test results accepted in the other NAFTA countries. Loss of sovereignty. Okay? And the U.S. Welcome to Renewal Recognition Agreement among the accountants. This is the most difficult of all the issues. The recognition that your degrees, you won't have that problem because we are accredited by the Southern Association. But most universities in Mexico don't have that accreditation. And so the problem is, when you want to go into the United States, your degree has to go through a process of validation. And if it is accounting, medical, etc., you have to go through several processes there and here, which are different. So one of the things that you would like to do is let people move from one place to the other without having to revalidate their studies. Well, in accounting, we have it. Tough luck here in this international business. These are the questions, okay? This is where we start next class.